soldier with no armor In the middle of the battle I was broken I was broken It was only getting darker In the valley of the shadow I was hopeless I was hopeless I never thought that I would ever see the day when every single chain would break or hear the voice of heaven call my name and then Christ came changing everything he took my sin and shame away now every song I sing will be for him ever since the moment he walked in I was searching for a reason to believe that I could ever really matter, ever matter. I was hoping I was reaching, so desperate for my soul to find its Savior. I need a Savior. Then Christ came, changing everything. He took my sin. Since the moment he walked in, then Christ came. Oh, 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 oh. You are the one I prayed for. You are the one I was made for. Hallelujah. Jesus, you gave me purpose. Jesus, you told me. I'm worth it. today is the fact that Christ has come. And so we have a lot of things that we hope for, a lot of things that we look forward to, but all of that stuff, in all of that stuff, we can be hopeful because we know that Christ has come. We have a Savior, and Christ loves us enough that all who turn to him will be forgiven and will be saved. That's what we celebrate today. My name is Jesse. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm glad that you've come to join us for worship Would you please stand with us and sing? And while you're getting ready to sing, why don't you warm up your voices by saying hello to the people around you and and making sure that you know who they are and what their name is.
God. Amen. Amen. Woo. Good stuff this morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Waterway Church. My name's Anthony Johnson. I'm one of the elders here. Glad to see everybody here this morning. If you're a visitor, we're especially glad you're here. Check us out in the lobby at our connection table. Talk to people around you. Those that are regulars here, talk to those visitors around you. We're glad you're here. There's a QR, co QR code on the seat in front of you if you want to scan that too if you're a visitor. We want to get to know you. Our mission here is to become more like Jesus. That's what we strive for, and that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come in to this worship this morning. We're going to start out with our devotion. It's from Micah. If you can find that in your Bible, you get a prize. <laughs> because I know I have trouble finding Micah. So turn with me to Micah 7, verses 7 to 9. It's going to be on the screen behind me also. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath. Until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. We like this passage this morning because it is a reminder. It is a reminder that in God, we can be forgiven and we can be restored. God picks us up. We don't do it ourselves. Like Micah, though, we must watch for God. When we stay close to God, our enemies do not have victory. But we can't fall into the trap of thinking it's because of us that we are sovereign. We talked about that in Sunday school a little bit this morning. He is our relief. He is our victory. Only God. Nothing that we do. Are you hungry for him this morning? Are you hungry for God? Pastor Jesse's going to expand on that this morning as he preaches out of Psalm 27. So dwell on that. Dwell on what Micah's thoughts were. Are you hungry for God today? He is our victory. A couple of announcements today. There's announcements that scroll on our screen before and after the worship service, so keep up to date on them. Diana Wood contacted me. She is still looking for Sunday school substitutes for the summer. It'd be nursery, pre-K, and elementary school substitutes. Please see her. Diana, where are you at? 
She's, there she is, that's Diana. See her if you want to substitute uh, for the young kids. The office will be closed this week. Uh, Fourth of July will be closed on Tuesday. No one will be here, so don't come. So, <laughs> all right. Um, next week, we're going to have a mission focus throughout the morning, uh, plus a meal at noon. It's going to be a mission meal at noon. So everyone's in invited to stay for lunch next week. Um, we are going to hear about the different missions that the church supports, that you support. And then the meal is also going to be built around that. And there's going to be some information about the different missionaries we support. And I believe it says here, food from the regions where our missionaries serve. So that's going to be pretty cool. So you're going to want to stay next week uh, for lunch and just the whole mission Sunday. I'm going to ask Kevin Martin to come forward. And he's going to speak about the youth trip this week that led them down to Kentucky. Good morning, everyone. So you, one of the scrolling announcements you may have seen on the screen over the past number of weeks was a reminder that the youth senior high were headed to Kentucky on a mission trip. And that did happen this past week. We left on last Sunday morning before you all got here, about 5.30 in the morning, we were in the parking lot gathering things up and heading out. And we returned this past Friday about 5.30 in the afternoon. So we spent uh, six days together, uh, 14 of us in total, 10 senior high youth and four folks helping to, to lead and direct and um, give some continuity to the group. We had a wonderful time, and I'm not going to spoil it too much because on July 23rd, Sunday, July 23rd, during Sunday school, the youth group is going to share more details about the trip. But we did, just did want to take a moment this morning and say, number one, thank you for your prayers. We had a excellent week. Uh, we were in eastern Kentucky. The people of eastern Kentucky um, are just down and out for the most part. They have the coal industry that kind of sustains that area, but the coal industry continues to decline, and the people there are kind of left with low unemployment and just very little to kind of lift their spirits. Uh, the verse that uh, Anthony just read said about, even though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. That just reminded me of our whole trip. You know, so many people just sitting in darkness um, with not a whole lot of hope, sitting in a coal mine where it's dark, and then, but the Lord is their light. Um, so we're, we're excited to share with you about that in a few weeks. In the meantime, um, the things we did ranged from rebuilding and staining decks and wheelchair ramps for folks that have been stuck in their houses since the flood. Um, a lot of flood work and flood relief is still happening down there. I don't know if you remember, about a year ago, there was what they called the thousand-year flood happened in the eastern Kentucky. So you had people that were kind of down and out and didn't have much to begin with, now had flood waters 11 foot high in some of the towns come through and just totally devastate the area. So there's a lot to do. We will we'll share more about that. Um, I'm going to end, though, with I've asked each person that went on the trip to shout out one descriptive word of the trip. So we'll, we'll see how that entails. I'll kind of scan the crowd here and start at the left and go from there. Relationships. Listening. Eye opening. Outreach. Fun. Fun. Joyful. Educating. Refreshing. All right. So you will hear more about that in a few weeks, but thank you for your prayers. And we got another guy down here. Midnight. Midnight. <laughs> Maybe you'll hear about inside jokes too. So thank you. If it wasn't for the church and your support, we wouldn't be able to do something like this. It impacts me, I believe, hopefully. It impacts our young people. It's going um, just so much laughter and fun and joy, and it's all because of um, the fellowship we have here and the opportunities uh, you guys give our senior high. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Isn't this exciting? Isn't it exciting we can send our youth out, spread the gospel, Spread the worth ethic, work ethic of God, the help ethic. I shouldn't say work ethic, the help ethic. Of what we're here to do to reach out. I'm excited to hear from them. Um, I'm really excited to hear about midnight. So <laughs> we'll find out about that. Uh, 
We're going to move into our prayer time here. As always, if you have a prayer request, we have a box in the lobby right around the corner here that we want that prayer request. We want to know about it, and we want to be able to pray for you. We also have in the back of the sanctuary our offering box. Um, you place your offerings in there. If you look at your bulletin, there's a lot of people that are hurting this week, and there's a lot of people that have been on there for a while. Please pray for them throughout the week. It's a growing list, and uh, it's tough right now. A lot of people deal with continual pain. So we're going to pray for relief this morning. We want to lift up the Christian Hope, Hope Christian Center this morning in the Bronx, New York. That's our July mission support partner. They're in the Bronx, and they're profoundly Christian residential program for men recovering from different types of drug addiction. Go to Hope Center ny.org, and you can give and find out a little bit more about them. We also want to pray for Emma Troop this morning. I think Emma's here, Emma and Avery. They are going in tomorrow for a C-section, and we just want to pray for them tomorrow that the procedure goes well, and for the little one, it's going to be a lot of excitement for the family. So we praise God for that. Bow your heads with me this morning as we come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for a place that we can come together to worship you as the family of God. We pray this morning you bring your Holy Spirit on this service. Be with Pastor Jesse as he brings your words to us. We thank you for your love and understanding in our lives. We pray for those on our list this morning. We pray for Jim, Phil, and Elaine. Pray for Charles and Anne Marie in Tokyo. John, Patty, Emma, and Avery. Lord, speak to each situation. Give relief where it's needed. Give comfort. Give guidance. Give wisdom to doctors. We thank you, Lord, for the rain we've received the past two weeks. We prayed for it a month ago. We prayed for it hard throughout the last two months. We thank you for your blessings. You are sovereign. You are supreme. We realize that. We're so thankful for how good you've been to us. Bless this service this morning. Pray that it pleases you. Holy Spirit, speak to us. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We praise you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue to sing and worship the Lord through music. God of angel armies.
is always by my side, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Amen. Praise you, Jesus.
child of God And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God When a peace like the river That's your glory. Thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Congregation, I can't tell you how beautiful it is to stand here and sing and to hear you all singing, and to see you singing, and to be able to sing together the words that we've sung, Lord, you are faithful, you are faithful, nothing formed against me shall stand. I'm no longer a slave to fear, 
I'm a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I'm a child of God, and it's well with my soul. Some of you who are sitting in the back, you know, there, there's, there's good seats all over the room, but there is something about being able to be here and hear all of you sing in this way. So if any of you, um, if, if any of you need to, to get up and, and move to the front just so you can so you can enjoy that last song a little better. That's great. Or, or maybe next week. But uh, it is a joy to be able to sing together. To be able to sing together. Here's what we're going to do for the next minute or so. I'm going to read for you. I know. Thank you. <laughs> we will dismiss the kids to Children's Church. But I'm going to read for you first from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This is Psalm 27. We're going to come back to it. We're going to think about it and pray about it some more. But we're going to do that while the children are having children's church. And today we have children's church for kids between four years old and first grade. So that is first graders who have just finished up first grade. So if you are at least four, and if you haven't started second grade yet, why don't you come down here and join me? I have a couple questions for you. Whoa. A lot of excitement. All right. All right. Come on down, boys. I have a couple questions for you. Now, now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But how many of you, how many of you have at least one thing that you're kind of a little bit scared about? Like, if you had to be honest, how many of you? Like, for example, I know some people are kind of scared of the dark. Is anybody maybe a little bit scared of the dark? Yeah, is anybody? I know some people that are scared of snakes. Do you know anybody that's scared of snakes? Yeah. I know, you know, I know some people that are scared of public speaking. Do you know what public speaking is? That's standing up in front of people and talking. Do you know any people that are afraid to talk in front of others? Yeah. No, I don't either. <laughs> but here, listen, guys, this is what we're going to talk about today while you guys go to children's church. One of the things that we're going to be talking about is in the Bible, King David, one of the things that he wrote down and that he said to God is, God, because I know you love me, I don't have to be afraid. Does that make sense? Yeah. He said, God, because you love me so much and I know you're taking care of me, I don't have to be afraid of anything. Because God's in charge, and God is good, and he loves us. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So I wonder, while we get ready to think about that, and while you guys get ready for children's church, do you think we can pray together? Pray to our God who loves us so much that we don't have to be afraid? Yeah, let's pray. I like to pray with my hands together. I usually bow my head and close my eyes when I pray with you guys. God, thank you for these boys and girls. And I pray, I pray that they would not fear any bad thing. 
but Lord, that they would instead put their hope in you. Lord, help them to have a healthy respect for all the things that need their respect. Help them to give honor to all the people to whom they owe honor. But Lord, help these kids and help all of us big kids not to be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to where Ryan and Dave are standing and they'll guide you to Children's Church. All right. Now, it's kind of fun the way some things are working out today. Uh, a couple of things that are coming together. I'd love to say that I planned every detail, that man, the elders and the worship team sat down and planned every detail. Didn't quite work that way. There's a couple things that are just sort of happening. And here's what's happening. We've got a scripture in Psalm 27 that says, I'm no longer afraid. David talks to God and says, even in the presence of my enemies, I'm not worried. We sang songs that say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. We got to sing that together. And now we're going to hear a testimony from a young man who had a scary event, but who made his way through it and now has a story to tell. So I'm going to invite Caleb Cunningham to come forward and sit up here with me today. Caleb, um, I heard about Caleb's, this part of Caleb's story, uh, the day that it happened. Caleb's dad, Dennis, came and I was greeting people at the front door and, and Dennis said, Jesse, I just need to tell you. And so I heard this story before and, and Caleb, I've been just waiting for the day that, um, that we could talk about this together. But uh, let's pray, okay? God, I thank you for my brother Caleb. Help him to be able to share this story well and Lord, help us to point to your glory in all things that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so Caleb, you are... Um, uh, you are, among other things, a volunteer firefighter. That, that's something that I know has kind of taken your passion the last couple years. Yep. And so not too long ago, you had a little bit of an adventure that, uh, that I've been asking you about. Can you tell us about your adventure? So Easter morning, um, my department and a bunch of other local departments went to a house fire. Um, my crew was tasked with fire suppression in the second floor of one of the buildings. Fire suppression. So for normal people, that means you put the fire put out. Put out the fire. Okay. Yep. All right. <laughs> so we were in the second floor. We were up there for a couple minutes. And um, me and another guy went into a back bedroom. And he stayed out in the hallway. I went into the bedroom. And the floor collapsed down into the first floor. And the first floor was really on fire. Uh, yeah. Before that, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you're not supposed to go through the floor. Nope. Okay. But you did. Yep. Okay. <laughs> What next? So, after I fell through the floor, it was, I couldn't see anything through the smoke. Um, I was in there for nine minutes, buried um, from my chest down. Boy, it's so much easier to talk about when we're eating pizza, isn't it? Yeah. So, nine minutes, um, laying there in the dark by myself. Um, there's a lot that goes through your head in nine minutes. And you knew your buddies knew where you were at, right? I mean, you knew that they were working to come get you, but that's still got to yeah. be a strange feeling. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's a lot that goes through your head. One of the main things that uh, kept coming back to me is the night before that, um, me and a couple of buddies were hanging out. And we were talking about keeping each other accountable to reading the Bible and uh, just getting closer to Jesus. Yeah. So uh, that was about 1.30 in the morning. I got home from that fire, the, the campfire, and, uh, so? and opened up my Bible for the first time in <laughs> it was probably a month or two that I had opened mm -hmm. my Bible. And I just didn't know where to start. Picked a random page, random verse, just opened it up, put my finger down, and that's what I read. And that verse was Isaiah 43, 2. And it says, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. 
So that's like two o'clock in the morning after you've been out at a campfire with your buddies and you're talking about yeah. <laughs> reading your Bibles. You come home and you read that. Now, Caleb's a young man and, and he can function at those hours of the night differently than I can. But you read from Isaiah 53 too, and then I guess you went to bed for a little bit? Yeah, so. But then the fire call came at what time? That was 2.50 about. That so like an hour that. later? Yep, an hour later. Okay, I'm so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, after I read that, you know, I thought, oh, that's kind of a cool verse for a firefighter and you know, highlighted it and went to bed. An hour later I woke up and that's when we ended up going to that call. So that was definitely kept running through my head. It's kind of the main thing that kept coming back to me um, for nine minutes when I was in there. And in the moment, I was never scared. I was more scared looking back on it after the fact. Um, cause, yeah, in the moment, I knew that I knew God was with me, and that uh, just that verse just kept coming through my head and bringing me hope as well. Um, So my best friend that was at the campfire, he runs with another fire department and I knew he was there. And I knew that he wouldn't stop until I was out. Because <laughs> if the roles were reversed, I know that uh, nobody would stop me until he was out. So. So nine minutes, nine minutes, they came and got you, and uh, I'm sure they were, were checking you out. Were there medics there, yeah. or, and uh, what was wrong with you? Nothing. Not a bruise, <laughs> scratch, broken bone, nothing. How was, uh, how was mom and dad doing? <laughs> dad was calmer than mom was. <laughs> And what's it like in that moment? I'm sure there's adrenaline. And as you said, you had a lot of peace. I mean, that, those verses are going through your mind. We can see your emotion today as you look back on it. How long did it take until you had a little bit of that spike of, oh, wow, that was really, really tough. Is that hours or days? Did that fear ever come in or have you just always felt great. How do you deal with that, Caleb? You've had a couple, couple weeks, couple months now to sort of look yeah. back on it. How's, how's that go? It took a couple days for the fear to kind of sink in. Um, just to realize what could have been? to realize what happened and what could have happened and um, you know, how good God was that I turned out the way that it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the Best day that I, the best way that I dealt with it is just those same friends that were at that campfire that night, just being able to talk to them and, and have them with me and mm -hmm. just kind of go through it together. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And so you're living a lot of your life around fires right now, uh, campfires on purpose <laughs> and, uh, and other fires as a, as a rescuer. Uh, you have quite a testimony. Yeah. And you've got a Bible verse now that's always going to be in your mind. Absolutely. And you can share it with all those guys and girls that are just as into fire as you are, right? Yep. All right. Well, I am so glad, Caleb, that you were able to walk through the fire without being hurt. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your story today. Is there anything else we need to know about what God's been doing in your heart before I release you to go sit back down? Um... One thing um, that I ask kind of for you guys to pray for is that um, my department, and I know a lot of other departments out there, are majority non-believers. 
Um, so just for you know, prayers that I'd be able to use my story to be able to bring more of those firemen to Jesus um, because we do a dangerous job. So just okay. prayers for that. <laughs> Amen. Caleb, can we pray for you right now? Sure. Lord God, I am so thankful for my brother Caleb. I thank you that in this case you were so faithful to the words in Isaiah. I thank you, Lord, for protecting him, for protecting his buddies who helped him. And Lord, I thank you that today he can tell this story. Help him, Lord. Holy Spirit, come upon him in a powerful, fresh way so that he can keep telling this story so that others would know who you are and find a saving faith in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Caleb, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I appreciate you. Thanks. Oh, man, the songs got me crying, and now Caleb has me crying. Everybody just take a breath. Can't even move out of the way of the chairs. Hey, listen, it is, um, it's really exciting to hear about God at work, isn't it? I mean, isn't it exciting just to know that our, our God is still working? He, he's not just far away looking down on us saying, good luck. But our God is still at work in so many different ways. And how many of you have stories that you could tell of the ways that God has brought you through things that when you look back, you say, oh, wow, that was so close, right? We're going to hear more of these stories as time unfolds. But until we hear them all, we will just keep praising God. Let's come back again to... Uh, to Psalm 27, because this is where we're going to spend the rest of our time today. I'd like to read this one more time all together. And so it's on the screen up here behind me. Um, would you read along with me? And we're going to read all 14 verses of Psalm 27, but can we read this together out loud? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of a sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Now, before I jump into some of my thoughts and reflections, I wonder, are there any of you who have one sentence or less one sentence or less, are there any of you who have one sentence or less of a reflection or a thought or a question that comes from the verses we just read? Any thoughts, anything that hits you before we kind of dive into the rest of the sermon? Go ahead and just shout it out if there's anything that God put on your heart while you were reading. Hope, yes. God is faithful. The sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means God is in charge, right? Anything else? What else did you hear in there? Wait, yes. Wait on the Lord. What else did you hear? Protect me in your house. 
Protect me in your house. Amen. Anything else that struck you as we read together? Mercy. 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 What else did you hear? My way doesn't work. My way doesn't work. Ah, there's a lesson to learn, isn't it? Thank you for your reflections. It's exciting to hear how God moves and, and speaks to all of us. But here are the words of David. As we come to the psalm, we have to remember just a little bit of context. This is written by King David, and we don't know exactly at what point in his life David wrote this. Whether he was a young man just kind of beginning as a, as a king, whether this might have even been something that happened to him before he was a king, when he was running from Saul or when he had just been called. It might be a psalm that was written when he was older, near the end of his life. But this was written by King David about a thousand years before Jesus walked on the earth. Okay, so as he's talking about waiting, as he's talking about looking for God's hope, one of the things that is different in his situation than in ours is that he was waiting for something that we've already received. He was waiting for Jesus Christ, the Messiah of God, to be revealed and, and then to have that Son of God on earth for, for people to put their hope in. He was looking forward to that, whereas we... 3,000 years after David, 2,000 years after Christ, we can look back and see what Jesus did. We can read in our Bibles and see what Jesus said and what he taught and the things that he did and, and the things that he commanded us to do. So we're in a little bit of a different place than David was in that respect, right? The Messiah has been revealed to us. David was still waiting. That's a key piece of hope that he was hoping in and that we now build our hope upon. But for so many of the other things that David writes about, we can see that these are timeless, right? You see, verse 1 of Psalm 27, David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? How many of you have been afraid of somebody, even recently? I mean, this is something we can identify with. This David who went out and stood before Goliath, knows something about fear. David, who was this king and who was this general, I can't imagine what it would be like to prepare to go into war. A few of you do know that feeling. But I can't imagine what kind of fear that must be. But here David says, no, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David goes on in verse 2, when the wicked advance against me to devour me, it's my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. It's interesting, David was never himself killed by another army, even though he was in a lot of battles. David simply says, when the wicked advance me, it's them who's going to stumble and fall. Do any of you feel like you have wicked people advancing against you? Are any of you in any kind of a situation where you feel like wickedness is just kind of coming your way? Or, or if you need to think about it more broadly, maybe not just coming at you, but maybe do you feel like, is there wickedness coming at your family? Is there wickedness coming at your friends? Is there wickedness being directed towards our church fellowship or, or towards a set of values? Of course, we can relate to this, right? Even though David wrote it so many millennia ago, we can understand what he means when he says, the wicked advance against me to devour me. But then David speaks faith. He says, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Verse three, he says, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be confident. Even then. How many of you know the glory of being confident in the Lord? And how many of you know the struggle of not having that confidence? Can you relate to what David is writing? Of course we can. And I hope you can relate to this next part too. Because I think verse 4 from Psalm 27 is one of the key verses that can help to guide our lives in this whole passage. We can relate to the fear. We can relate to the, to the wondering. And, and, and we can relate to, many of us can relate to some confidence even in the midst of fear. God gives us strength. We hear Caleb talking about how even in that moment when he was for nine minutes trapped underneath the rubble, he, he was not afraid because he had God's word. We can, we can understand that and hear that, right? I hope you can also understand verse four. What does David say? He says, I'm not afraid, but one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That sounds like three things, right? That I can dwell in the house and gaze on him and to seek him in his temple, but it's really all wrapped up in one big experience. David says, that's all I need. That's, that's the one thing I'm asking for because verses one through three are all statements, right? He's saying, God is faithful to me. I don't need to be afraid. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. My enemies will stumble and fall. I will not fear. I will be confident. But now he's asking and he says, God, the one thing I want, I just want to be with you. I want to be in your presence. I want to be able to see your beauty and seek you in your temple. Now, just so that you remember, the big temple had not been built yet. David talks about seeing God in his temple. Well, it was David's son Solomon who actually built the first temple. In the time of David, God and the, and the things of God were still housed in a tent. But David says, God, if I could just be in your presence, that's the thing I need. David who is confident, David who is not afraid, David who is not worried about people. He's not just trying to retreat to God. He wants to go and glory in God. And he says, that's the one thing I need. What about you? Church, what about you? In 2023, with your concerns, with the things that you struggle with, and also the things where you find victory, what is it that you're really looking for? What is your one thing? We'll come back to that question. It's been interesting. The last two weeks, there are a few different pastor groups with whom I interact. Um, one is a group within AMEC. AMEC stands for the Alliance of Mennonite Evangelical Congregations. That's, it's not a denomination, but if we are part of a denomination, that's, that's it. And so I got to meet with a couple of those pastors this week. There's also some fellows um, kind of in the local area that we interact on a regular basis for Bible study and prayer and that sort of thing. And one of the hot topics of the last couple of weeks is the movies and the podcasts that are based on tough things that have been happening in famous churches, right? Some of these, all of these are on, you know, you can find them on, on the different podcast channels or, or maybe on your different, uh, different television devices, whatever it is you use to see your content. But there's uh, just a few years ago, there was the podcast, the rise and fall of Mars Hill. I don't know if any of you checked that out. It was uh, Mars Hill was an evangelical mega church. It was out in Seattle. Uh, really grew through the early 2000s. Their pastor was Mark Driscoll um, when they were really hopping. They were marked by powerful preaching and thousands of people, especially young men, really coming to Christ. And they came, the interesting thing about the Mars Hill Church, they came from kind of a reformed theology that is really serious about the Bible. And they were really preaching the Bible and people were responding. But there's a podcast that you can listen to that talks about some of the challenges that happened in-house that made that church basically crumble. There's a documentary that came out recently about the Hillsong churches. Hillsong is an Australian congregation and then a network of churches that grew out of the Assemblies of God tradition. And so the Assemblies of God, that's a, a charismatic background that is really serious about praising God with everything you've got. And yet in that particular church and then in that network of churches, there were really tough things that have happened and, and some real problems with leaders, things that were covered up. And in fact, there are court cases happening right now talking about things that have happened in the past. And then there's the, um, there's the shiny happy people documentary that came out talking about uh, Bill Gothard. Uh, the Duggars are kind of the famous family and the famous people who've gotten wrapped up in, in that story. But Bill Gothard, uh, who's still alive today, came from a conservative Christian background. He talked about the teachings of Jesus as essential. His emphasis through the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s was on marriage, family, and raising children. And that emphasis and that teaching influenced a variety of Christians in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Many people associated um, him with the Baptists, but he also gained a following among some of the Mennonite groups here in our area back in the 70s and 80s. There are three different, really different kinds of high-profile churches and ministries represented by Mars Hill, Hillsong, and Bill Gothard in that group. Three really different kinds of churches, three different men, Driscoll, Houston, and Gothard, and three different styles of interacting with followers, outsiders, and God, but three very similar sets of crises that brought these stories out to people's attentions. What happened is that pastors and leaders were found guilty of treating people in their churches terribly, even instances of sexual abuse in some of these stories. At some point, as, as 
these other pastors and I were kind of reflecting on this. There's no celebration in any of this, right? There's no good there. It's just sad when you hear about Christians who have high profile failures. But as we talked about this as pastors and, and thinking, okay, how do, we, how do we make sure that we don't fall into any of the traps that those folks did? It came up and we were reminded that at some point for those folks and for countless others who've never been discovered, at some point working for God and influencing people became more important than the leaders themselves walking with God. Somehow, working for drowned out walking with. And it's amazing the things that were done and then, and then the terrible things that were covered up or you know, we'll just make it go away or the people that were paid off or, or the things that were silenced because we're on a mission from God here and we've got to make sure that the message keeps going out. And yet terrible atrocities were attempted to be swept under the rug. These people who are in these documentaries, in these stories over and over are people who, who gave their lives to serving God, to planning churches and pointing people to holiness as they understood it. These are people who were teaching out of the Bible. And yet, these leaders were not walking with God. And terrible prices were paid and are being paid by the people who were supposed to be in their care. How does that happen? Well, again, I would submit to you that that happens because among other problems, these leaders, while they were trying to work for God, they forgot to walk with God. Perhaps that's why I'm drawn to Psalm 27:4 so powerfully. David says, the one thing I ask from the Lord, and David is on a mission from God, right? He is God's chosen king. He is the one after God's own heart, and we know that David was not perfect either, was he? But what's his statement? What does he declare? Verse 4, he says, God, I'm a soldier, and I'm a king, and I'm a worshiper, and I'm a leader. He was a husband, and he was a father. But he says, God, the one thing I ask for, it's not for success in my ministry, the thing that David asked for was not influence with people. The thing that David asked for was not even just that, that, that all the stuff would happen that needs to happen. What did David ask for? The one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. What do I seek more than anything else? And what do you? What is it that you're looking for? I mean, there are lots of things that we want. There are lots of things that we go through in our prayers that are even good things. God, God bless us and protect us. God, watch over my children. Lord, provide my daily bread. Lord, forgive me my debts, even as I forgive my debtors. Lord, protect me from the evil. And these are all prayers that we offer. And how many do you have? Lord, help me, help me find a job or help me to do well at my job or help me to be able to retire from my job. We pray for our relationships and our, our husbands and wives, the ones that we wish were our husbands and wives, the ones and we wish they were not. We pray for our children, the ones that we have and the ones that we don't have, the ones who are succeeding and the ones who are floundering. We pray for them, and, and we should pray for all of that. Those are all things that are on my mind, and they're on your mind too. But what should be the number one thing? I think David has touched on it here in Psalm 27, that we can be that we can be in the presence of God. And oh God, even to just gaze upon your face. I mean, in the time of David, he understood. He knew the writings of Moses. He knew that people don't get to look face to face at God and live. But yeah, he said, God, I just want to be with you. I just want to be in your presence. I just want to be close to you, Lord. Why? Why is this his prayer? Look what David says in verse 5. He says, because in the day of trouble, he'll keep me safe in his dwelling. If I'm close to God, I'm taken care of even in times of trouble. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. 
In verse 6, David says, Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. David says, I'm going to sacrifice and I'm going to sing. In verse 7, he says, God, hear my voice when I call. Be merciful to me and answer me. So David's going to sacrifice and sing and he's going to call. And then in verse 8, David says, My heart says of you, seek his face and your face, Lord, I will seek sacrificing, singing, calling, and seeking. David is doing all this, he says, because I know, Lord, that if I am close to you, everything else is fine. I know, Lord, that if I am close to you, all of these other things will be taken care of. He says, I know, Lord, that that real life is found in being with you, not just in having my circumstances work out. Have any of you ever gotten everything you wanted and still not been happy? Have any of you been there? Or maybe you haven't gotten everything you wanted, but you finally got that thing you wanted. Anybody ever buy a new car that you really were waiting for? Any of you ever finally get that house that was, that was the one that looks like it's just, oh, this is the one we're going to be here for the rest of our lives? Any of you finally get to that, get to that point where you you've finally reach that number that was your number? And, and have any of you noticed that those are not the things that really bring you satisfaction. Good as some of those things are, have you ever noticed that that even those things can be empty? That's what David's pointing to here. He says, God, I'm not going to ask you for success. I just want to be with you because I know that if I'm with you, all this other stuff is going to work out. Psalm 27, verse 8, my heart says, if you seek his face and your face, Lord, I will seek. Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. In other words, he says, God, you have been my helper. Don't change that. Let me keep going with you. Let me keep getting close to you. Don't reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord, you will receive me. And so I will continue to seek you. What what could be different in our world? What could be different in these ministries that I've listed today? How could the stories be different if people had continued to seek God's face in everything they did instead of seeking anything else? Do you see what David has committed to in these verses? In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, 13, some of you know this and you have it, you have it stamped in your mind. But Jeremiah 29, 13, God, speaking to the exiled people of Israel, says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What did Jesus say? Well, in Matthew 7, this is a thousand years after David wrote Psalm 27. Jesus said to his followers, he said, look, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus is saying, look, if you are seeking after God, and not just talking about all these worldly things that we might want, because Jesus has already laid a foundation by the time Matthew 7 was written. Jesus has already laid a foundation that says your hearts should be absolutely dedicated to God. Jesus says, if you ask, it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It's as if David is responding to what David, or Jesus is responding to what David said so many generations before when David says, I just want to seek his face. And Jesus says, yes, this is what it's about. And then in Acts 17, another one of those New Testament passages, this is, this is a, a bit of time after Jesus has risen from the grave after he had died on the cross. In the book of Acts, talking about what Jesus' followers did There's a sermon starts in verse 24. For those of you who really want to dig in, Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. This is a sermon that was given to try to convince people that the Lord was the Lord. It says in Acts 17, 25, that God is not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, God himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And then it says in Acts 17, 27, that God did this so that mankind would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. God built humanity so that we would do what David is writing about, that we would seek him and find him because God wants to be found. He wants to be in a relationship with us. Have you ever been hungry to be closer to somebody else? 
Maybe it's a relationship that's been going for a long time and you drifted apart and you just wish it could be better. Or maybe you are solitary and just feeling lonely and you just wish there was someone who could be close. Do you know that feeling? And, and I'm not talking about the kind of desperate thing that says, oh, I'm lost without anyone else. I'm talking about like the real, honest, genuine kind of emotion that says, I just wish I had deeper connection. That's what God wants with us, with all of us. It's how God is, is hungry to be in relationship with us. Acts 17, 27 says, God built us so that we would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far away from any of us. And this is what David's writing about when he says, God, my heart cries out to you. This is what David is writing about when he says, the one thing I ask from the Lord is that I may dwell in his house all the days of my life, to gaze on his beauty, to seek him in his temple. David continues this psalm. So it opens up with these first three verses or so of just, I'm not afraid. I've got nothing to worry about because God is mine. And then there's this prayer in verses four through 10 where he says, God, let me see your face. Let me be closer to you and, and everything will be fine. And now he continues to cry out, Jeremiah, in, uh, I'm sorry, not Jeremiah, in Psalm 27, 11, teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. David knows that he has, well, today we would call it a platform. David knows that he has influence. David knows that people are going to see him. David has people who are working actively against him. And in verse 11 of Psalm 27, he says, teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Verse 12, don't turn me over to the desires of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. The picture is this. David says, God, there are so many people speaking against me. They're trying to oppress me. They want to see me fall. God, help me to walk in your path so that they don't get the satisfaction. He cries out and he says, God, I want to see your face. I want to be close to you. And I'm not afraid. But there are people who are working against me. And God, I know that on my own I can't do it. This is why he has to pray. I mean, if David were good enough, smart enough, strong enough on his own, he'd just say, and now, God, I've got this. Thanks. That's not what he does. He says, God, this matters. I'm at a critical spot here. I'm living life in a way that matters, that makes a difference. People see me. And if they see me get closer to you, they might get closer. But if they see me fall, they're going to gloat over me. And God, your name is going to be hurt as well. Can you relate to that? Do any of you have people watching you? Well, if you're sitting here right now and you're not in the very back row, you probably do. Lord, help me to stay awake because I don't want anybody else to gloat over me. Help my kids to sit still because I don't want any, right? What David is saying is, it's not just little things like that. David is saying, God, there are bad people wishing bad things about me. And if they see me do something bad, then it's just gonna, it's just gonna feed their fire. He says, teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of them. I already know you. You're my God. We are close and I am confident. But Lord, there's stuff around me for their sake. Don't turn me over. What is the desire of his foes? That David would fall and that David would fail. These people are bringing false, malicious accusations against him. He says, Lord, don't let that become true because of my error, because of my foolishness. He says, help me to follow you. And then as David begins to wrap up this psalm, he says in verse 13, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. After he states God's goodness and after he brings his prayer, he says, I know, Lord, that I'm going to see your good happening here. The other night, um, Brie had some friends who invited her to go to the Oxford Carnival. And um, one of the things about the Oxford Carnival is that we needed to drop her off. And so we did that thing that parents of kids who are not driving yet have to do. We, is it worth it to drive there and then drive back home and then drive back and then drive back home? And so Melanie and I dropped Brie off and got her situated with her friends and got her her little tickets so that she could ride the death traps. And, and so... <laughs> We got her set up and then we decided to take a walk around because they have all these food trucks and I like food trucks. And so we walked around and I saw a fellow in the crowd wearing a hat like this. This hat, um, in case you can't see it, it has our waterway logo on the front. 
I, um, I asked for, um, there's a company that made us some t-shirts and stuff uh, some, some years ago, and I asked them if they could design a hat for me. This was when we were moving into this new building. I said, could you design a hat for me so that I could wear them and just kind of get the word out a little bit because we had a new name and we were sort of rebranding. You remember some of this stuff if you were here for a while. And I had a dozen of these made because that's how many it took to, to do that. And so I bought them and, and I would wear them. And if anybody ever asked me about it, and if I hadn't like already got it all sweaty and gross, I would wear them. And if anybody asked me about it, I'd, I'd just give them one. Sometimes the one that I was wearing, if it was still crisp. But oftentimes just one that I kept in my closet because I thought that that'd be a fun way to kind of do that. And a couple of you have these hats. What was really fun was that the other night at the Oxford Carnival, I saw a fellow walking, and, and he was a young guy, and I discovered uh, just a few minutes later that he only speaks Spanish, or, or at, least, at least he does not speak English. He may speak Spanish and 94 other languages, but English is not one of them, because I saw him wearing this hat with his little kid on his shoulders, and, uh, and I just said, hey, nice hat, and he kind of smiled and said, thanks, and, and I said, where did you get that? Because I know I never gave him one. I was just curious. I was excited. It was, here's this guy wearing a waterway hat. And he just, it was very clear that and he, we kind of had our little bit of sign language and communication. Okay, he wasn't understanding me. We walked away and I just said to Melanie, this is, this is, there is somebody wearing a hat. And for better or for worse, they are representing our church in places that I will never get to. Speaking to people that I can't speak to. And that if I did speak to them, they wouldn't understand me. And, and I know that this, this hat doesn't spell out the whole gospel. This hat's not going to make someone saved. But this was a sign to me that, oh, God, you are still at work, aren't you? There is still stuff going on that I can't orchestrate and, and that you can't strategize for and that we can't figure out on our own. I don't even, I may not know until heaven how that happened. But here's a fellow wearing a church hat around at the Oxford Carnival, buying a funnel cake. David says, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, and I say, amen. Because these little things pop up all the time if you're looking for them. And I can see it on your faces today when you sing and as you pray and as you read the scripture, I can see the goodness of the Lord here in the land of the living because I can see that God is at work. So David wraps up this psalm in verse 14. He says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Why? Why wait? I mean, we're not people that wait, right? If, if I have to order something and it's going to take more than two days to get here, I'm like, well, what's wrong? We're not people who wait very well. But what does David say? David says, I am seeking God's face, and that's worth waiting for. And David says, I am confident that, that God is going to continue to deliver, and I am not afraid in the face of my oppressors, and I'm not afraid even in the face of my enemies. And, and God, I know that you're going to help me to walk in the right path so that my oppressors will not get any joy out of my fall. And, and David says to all of us then, he says, wait for the Lord, because it's worth the wait. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Do you remember Caleb's story of laying there pinned nine minutes of waiting? Caleb, I know that you read from Isaiah 43, 2, right? I was drawn this week to Isaiah 40, verse 30. that says that even youths grow tired and weary, and strong men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar, how? They will soar on wings like eagles, right? They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And we can wait on the Lord. We can be strong. We can take heart and wait on the Lord and see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Would you pray with me, church? Lord, there's a lot of hard stuff that we face. There, there is stuff that tries to be a distraction to us. There are people who are even working against us in, in different sectors of life. Lord, we can all tell those stories. But Lord, we trust you. We declare together that we trust you. Church, can you say amen? 
Lord, we trust you, and so we will wait on you. Lord, we will wait for your timing in all things. We will, we will wait for you to unfold everything as it needs to be unfolded because we know that you are sovereign, we know that you are good, and we know that your timing is perfect. Lord, while we wait, help us to continue to be confident. Help us to be strong. Help us to take heart. And Lord, help us to remember the things that we know for sure. Help us to remember that you are good, that you are love, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life in heaven with you forever. Lord, help us to remember that your word is true and that your promises are sure. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you. And help us to remember, Lord, that you are conforming us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, as we wait, help us to remember what we know to be true. Lord, we love you. And with David, we cry out. Say one thing we ask from you, Lord. This only do we seek. That we can dwell in your house all the days of our lives. To gaze on your beauty to seek you in your temple. Amen. Church, we're going to close our service by singing uh, the final song today, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Would you please, uh, would you please stand and sing with us now? What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning. Everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path goes from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Church, we got a, uh, got a prayer request here this morning. This is from Daisy Shetron. And Daisy just simply said, I'm asking for prayers for my asthma that has been getting bad. I'm sure that the air has much to do with it. It's been really hard to get it under control lately. So Daisy, we're going to pray for you that you can keep leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus and seeking God's face. But we're also going to ask Daisy that, that you'll be able to get relief in your lungs to be able to breathe. And so um, thank you so much, church, for being here today. I pray that you will continue to pray. And I pray that you'll continue to seek God's face. Because when you seek God's face and when you're in his presence, all the other stuff, all the other stuff is taken care of too. All right, so now go. Be the church and let your hope be on display. Amen? Amen. Amen.